the race is on to use neuroscience and technology to plug the learning gap between poor and rich children. Recent research shows children's life chances may depend less on showering them with knowledge and words. Kite, ki, koala. And more on opportunities to interact with adults. That specific type of communication is what is going to really benefit the child long term. But is this enough? Could a controversial focus on genetics be what's needed to break the class ceiling? We are at a tipping point in terms of how genetics is going to shape our lives. Let's put your shoes on, OK? It might look like Shadara and her son Kevin are getting ready for a trip to the playground. But this is no ordinary day. Oh my goodness, let's play. Where do you want to play first? Every word they say is being recorded on a tiny device known as a torque pedometer. Yeah! But instead of tracking steps, it counts words. The microphone is in the front and you don't want to obstruct it. You don't want anything to block the sound. The device picks up how many adult words he's hearing, how much electronic noise is in the background, and how many turns he's yeah. taking in talking to me when I communicate with him. The pedometers continuously collect data and are part of a scheme to transform how children learn language. It makes me more mindful, so now I'm always considering when I, I'm getting him ready, I'm like, am I talking to him enough? So let's go play with our toys. One influential study found that in the first three years of a child's life, those from wealthy families will have heard around 30 million more words than those from poorer backgrounds. And this word gap can set them back for years to come. Kids in poverty hear fewer adult words. And it's not because their parents are bad parents. It's because mom or dad is working two jobs. While the pedometers can be used by all families, including middle-class ones like Shadara's, the scheme helps poor kids to bridge this word gap. Every week, Shadara gets a breakdown of exactly how much she's spoken to her son while he was wearing the device. We've had several teachers in our district go through the program, and when I've talked to them after they get their first or second report, almost all of their comments are, I thought I was talking with my kid way more than this report actually shows. One study found this use of technology and data analysis led to a 32% increase in the number of words a child hears per hour. But it's not just about increasing the number of words children hear. The scheme's organisers are looking out for the number of so-called conversational turns. I tried to tell you last night, Papa, but... The area that we really encourage and try to promote the most growth in is that back and forth conversation between an adult and a child. There's tons of research that shows that that specific type of communication is what is going to really benefit the child long term. Neuroscience has shown the benefits of conversational turns as they appear to get round some of the disadvantages of growing up poor. It is well established that if a child grows up in poverty, this affects their growing brain. Low socioeconomic status or other types of disadvantage or adversity affect the developing brain. Parts of the brain that respond to threatening environments tend to accelerate so that children can be more resilient. Then there are other parts of the brain showing slower growth when exposed to adversity. But when children are engaged in high numbers of conversational turns, these differences in brain development caused by their background don't seem to matter. And regions of the brain associated with language development expand. Conversational turns is something directly in the child's everyday environment that seems to have an effect over and above socioeconomic status. 
Yet despite these insights from neuroscience and new tech, the gap in achievement between rich and poor kids hasn't changed for decades. By the time they are 10 in fourth grade, lower income students will have a reading score around 28 points below their richer classmates. And this gap hasn't really changed in the past 20 years. We're surprisingly ineffective at that, at closing the differences that we see between low-income and high-income children. In some cases, those gaps have actually gotten worse in the US in the last 25 years. So what else could help level the playing field? Professor Catherine Page Harden is a psychologist and geneticist who argues a new approach is needed. She believes understanding children's genetics could be key. From a genetic perspective, we can see that people who happen to inherit certain genetic variants are more likely to graduate from college. I think we're really used to thinking about the role that a child's family background plays in equality and inequality over the course of their life. And what we're seeing with the research now is that genetics plays just a bigger role in shaping these types of inequalities and in life outcomes. Professor Harden argues genetics could be used to identify the children least likely to do well at school, and that this offers the potential for better and more effective interventions to help them. You can have children spit into a tube, and for less than 75 American dollars, you can get a readout of their DNA, which can be used to see, okay, we know for some reason these kids with these genetic variants are less likely in 30 years to have graduated from college or gotten a PhD. Is this so exciting? She says that some existing interventions which don't take account of genetics could be improved. Is that intervention working disproportionately for people who are most likely to succeed in school or least likely, or is it working about the same for everyone? So far, those questions are really unknown because interventionists haven't really incorporated genetic tools into their research design. There's nothing that the state of North Carolina can do to justify what they did to me. The idea of using genetic information to shape social policy provokes strong reactions. It has a very dark and uncomfortable past. In the 20th century, genetic traits were used to promote the idea of racial superiority, sometimes in disturbing propaganda. I think many people worry because they say that's a way of dismissing a large chunk of the population. They talk about genetic determinism being right wing. But Professor Harden believes it doesn't have to be like this. We see these real fears that genetic information will be used to naturalize hierarchy. At the same time, we see an increasing embrace of thinking about our biology in relation to sexual orientation, in relation to weight. How does my genotype affect my difficulty of keeping off weight? So what I'd like to see is for that trend to continue, but around things related to academic achievement, achievement or educational attainment. Using genetic information like this is still a long way off. Its advocates will have to show that it can be done in a safe and ethical way, and that it will improve social mobility rather than increasing existing inequalities. Parents and children see that the DNA revolution is here. They want to know how it's affecting them. I expect it to be a really scientifically interesting and productive area of research moving forward. Hi, I'm Adrian Waldridge, political editor here at The Economist. If you'd like to read more about social mobility, then click on the link opposite. And if you'd like to watch more in our Now or Next series, Click on the other link. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.